The Shirangama Sutra, Fascicle 5 of 10. Chapter 4, Self-Enlightenment. Main Instruction on the Three Meditative Studies of the One Mind. Ananda said, World Honored One, Although the Tathagata has taught the second decisive point in the development of the mind, I think that if the man good at untying knots does not know how they came to be tied, he will be unable to undo them. In this assembly, I and those who need to study and learn more are in the same case. Since the time without beginning, we and our delusions have both been subject to birth and death, and although we have cultivated good qualities that have enabled us to widen our knowledge by hearing about it all, and so are called leavers of homes, we are like a person suffering from malaria which recurs every other day. Will you take pity on us and save us from drowning? Will you tell us which of our bodies and minds are in a knot, and how to untie it so that all suffering beings can escape from samsara and avoid falling again into the three realms of existence? After saying this, he and all the assembly prostrated themselves, shed bitter tears, and eagerly awaited the Buddha's supreme revelation. The Buddha took pity on Ananda and those in the assembly who still needed to study and learn, as well as on future living beings. In order to enable them to sow the cause of their future appearance in the world as teachers, and so become the eye of wisdom to guide coming generations, he extended his shining, golden-hued hand to touch Ananda's head and comfort him. Thereupon, all Buddha lands in the ten directions shook six times, and Tathagatas, countless as motes of dust, sent out from the tops of their heads radiant rays of light which reached Jetona to shine upon the Buddha's head. This had not been seen before by the assembly. Then Ananda and all those present heard countless Buddhas declare with one voice, Excellent Ananda! If you want to know about the innate ignorance that causes you to transmigrate in sansara, you should know that the roots of your birth and death are your six sense organs. If you want to know about Supreme Bodhi, it is these six organs that will enable you speedily to realize happiness and liberation and permanence in nirvana. Although Ananda had heard these Dharma voices, he was still not clear about their profound meaning. So he bowed and asked the Buddha, How can the same six organs cause me to transmigrate in sansara and be happy in absolute nirvana? The Buddha said, Ananda, both organs and their objects spring from the same source. Bondage and liberation are not two different things. Consciousness is illusory, like a flower in the sky. Ananda, your knowing originates from each phenomenon which takes on form because of your sense organs. Both form and seeing are mutually dependent, like two bundles of rushes that stand by leaning against each other. Therefore, if your intellect acts as the knower, this is the root of your ignorance. But if it is free from seeing, it will be nirvana, which is transcendental and pure. How then can the latter allow foreign elements to intrude? To repeat his instruction, the Buddha read the following gatha. True nature is free from all phenomena, which are illusions by causes created. Noumena neither rise nor fall, but all phenomena are flowers in the sky. The unreal reveals the real, but both are but illusions. Since there is nothing real nor unreal, how can there be a subject and an object? For between the two there is no true nature, like the point where two rush bundles meet when set upright. Tying and untying from the same cause arise, while the saintly and the worldly are not dual. Consider underlying nature at the point of meeting, where both is and is not cannot be. If you disregard it, you are in delusion. If you awaken to it, you are free at once. Six knots are untied one after the other. When six are undone, one vanishes as well. Choose an organ that is all penetrating to enter the holy stream and attain Bodhi. 
Old habits flow like torrents in Alia's subtle consciousness. Since the real yet unreal can create confusion, I have refrained from revealing it to you. If mind be set on searching for the mind, that which at heart is not illusion becomes illusory. If you stop all grasping, then there is nothing real. If what is not illusion ceases to arise, where can illusion be? This is the profound Lotus Dharma Law, the precious Bodhi of the Royal Gem, the Samadhi of seeing all things as illusion, which in a finger snap leads to the state beyond all study. The unsurpassed doctrine was followed by all Bhagwats in all directions on the one path that to Nirvana leads. How to Untie the Six Knots Thus Ananda and the assembly listened to the compassionate Buddha's unsurpassed sermon and gatha whose profound meanings were so enlightening and penetrating that their mental eyes were opened. They praised what they had never seen before. Ananda then brought his palms together, prostrated, and said, I have today listened to the Buddha's compassionate teaching, which revealed the pure, subtle, and permanent reality of the self-nature. But I am still not clear about how to untie the six knots, one after the other, and what you meant by, when the six knots are undone, the one also vanishes. Will you again take pity on this assembly and future generations and teach us in order to wash our defilements away? The Buddha, who was on his lion seat, adjusted his inner garments and outer robe and took from the teapoy a piece of beautiful cloth which the Yamadeva had given him. Then in the presence of the assembly he tied a knot and showed it to Ananda, asking, What is this? Ananda and the others replied, It is a knot. The Buddha then tied another knot and asked, What is this? They all replied, This also is a knot. The Buddha tied four more knots, showing each to Ananda and asking, What is this? They all replied that each was a knot. The Buddha said to Ananda, When I first tied this cloth, you called it a knot. There is only one piece of cloth, but why did you call the second and third ties also knots? Ananda replied, World Honored One, although there is only one piece of cloth, if you tie it once there will be a knot, and if you tie it a hundred times there will be a hundred knots. But this cloth has only six knots, because you only tied it six times. Why do you agree to my calling the first tie a knot, and disagree to the second and third ones also being called knots. The Buddha said, Ananda, originally there was only one piece of cloth, but when I tied it six times, there were six knots. As you see it, the length of cloth was the same before, but is now different with its six knots. The first knot I tied was called the first one, and altogether I tied six of them, do you think that the sixth one can be called the first knot? Ananda replied, No, world honored one. So long as there are six knots, the last one is the sixth and cannot be called the first. Even if I discuss this for the rest of my life, how can I number these six knots in the wrong order? The Buddha said, It is so. These six knots are different but come from one length of cloth, and you cannot reverse their order. It is the same with your six sense organs, which, though coming from the same source, are manifestly different. Ananda, clearly you object to the six knots and prefer one piece of cloth, but how can you obtain it? Ananda replied, If these six knots remain, concepts of right and wrong will arise in great confusion, with such things as this knot is not that one, and that knot is not this one. World Honored One, if all the knots were untied, there would remain nothing, with complete elimination of thisness and thatness. Then in the absence of even one, how can there be six? 
the Buddha said. Likewise, when the six knots are untied, the one also vanishes. It is because of confusion in your mad mind, since the time without beginning, that your intellect gives rise to illusions, the unceasing creation of which disturbs your seeing and causes it to perceive objects in the same way that troubled eyes see dancing flowers. Hence, in the clear and bright reality, arise without any cause all worldly phenomena, such as mountains, rivers, the great earth, sansara and nirvana, which are but dancing flowers created by confusion, trouble or passions, and inversion. Ananda asked, How can one untie these knots, created by trouble and confusion? Then the Buddha held up the piece of cloth, pulled its left end, and asked, Can it be untied in this way? Ananda replied, No, world-honored one. The Buddha then pulled the right end and asked, Can it be untied in this way? Ananda replied, No, world-honored one. The Buddha said, I have pulled both ends of the cloth, but have been unable to untie the knots. What will you do now? Ananda replied, World-honored one, each knot should be untied, in its center or heart. The Buddha said, Correct, Ananda, correct. A knot should be untied from its heart. Ananda, the Buddha Dharma which I expound manifests due to causes and is beyond those coarse forms that come from worldly concepts of mixtures and unions. When the Buddha reveals the mundane and supramundane, he knows their chief causes and concurrent conditions. He is even clear about the number of drops of rain in a place as many miles away from here as there are sand grains in the Ganges, as well as why pine trees are straight and brambles crooked, geese white and crows black. Therefore, Ananda, choose one organ from the six, and if its knot is untied, all objects of sense will vanish of themselves. When all illusions disappear, if this is not reality, what more do you expect? Ananda, tell me now if the six knots of this cloth can be untied simultaneously. Ananda replied, No, world-honored one, because they were originally tied one after the other and should be untied in the same order. Although they are in the same piece of cloth, they were not tied simultaneously. How can they now be untied all at once? The Buddha said, Your six organs should be disengaged in the same way. When you begin to disentangle them, you will realize that the ego is void. When this voidness is perfectly clear, you will realize that all dharma or phenomena are void. When you are disengaged from dharma, the voidness of ego and dharma will vanish. This is called the patient endurance of the uncreate, achieved by means of samadhi in the bodhisattva stage. After Ananda and the assembly had heard the Buddha's teaching, their understanding was clear and free from doubt and suspicion. Ananda brought his palms together, prostrated himself, and said, Today our bodies and minds are clear, at ease and unhindered. Though I have understood what you mean by the disappearance of both one and six, I am still unable to perfect my sense organs. World-honored one, I am like a lonely wanderer and a hapless orphan. How fortunate have I been to meet the Buddha and to be his relative, like a hungry baby who suddenly meets its suckling mother. This gives me a chance to attain the holy goal, but although I have listened to his profound words, I am still unawakened as if I had not heard them. Will you please reveal to me the ultimate approach by means of the appropriate organ? After saying this, he prostrated himself and concentrated on his inner potentiality to receive the profound instruction. Thereat, the world-honored one said to the great bodhisattvas and chief arhats in the assembly, I want to ask you bodhisattvas and arhats who have practiced my dharma and have reached the state beyond study this question. When you developed 
your minds to awaken to the eighteen fields of sense, which one did you regard as the best means of perfection, and by what methods did you enter the state of samadhi? Meditation on the Sixth Sense Data Kaudinya, one of the first five bhikshus, rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, When, soon after his enlightenment, we met the Tathagata in the Murikadava and Kukkuta parks, I heard his voice, understood his teaching, and awakened to the Four Noble Truths. When questioned by the Buddha, I interpreted them correctly, and the Tathagata sealed my awakening by naming me Agniatta, or Thorough Knowledge. As his wonderful voice was mysteriously all-embracing, I attained our hardship by means of sound. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, to me, sound is the best according to my personal experience. Upnishad then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha and declared, I also met the Buddha soon after his enlightenment, after meditating on impurity, which I found repulsive and from which I kept. I awakened to the underlying nature of all forms. I realized that even our bleached bones that came from impurity would be reduced to dust and would finally return to the void. As both form and the void were perceived as non-existent, I achieved the state beyond study. The Tathagata sealed my understanding and named me Nisat. After eradicating the relative form, Wonderful form, Sarupa, appeared mysteriously all-embracing. Thus, I attained our hardship through meditation on form. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, to me, form is the best according to my personal experience. A bodhisattva named Fragrance Adorned then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, after the Tathagata had taught me to look into all worldly phenomena, I left him and retired to set my mind at rest. While observing the rules of pure living, I saw the bhikshus burn sandal incense. In the stillness, its fragrance entered my nostrils. I inquired into this smell, which was neither sandalwood nor voidness, and neither smoke nor fire, and which had neither winds to come nor with it to go. Thereby, my intellect vanished, and I achieved the state beyond the stream of transmigration. The Tathagata sealed my awakening and named me Fragrance Adorned. After the sudden elimination of relative smell, the wonderful fragrance became mysteriously all-embracing. Thus, I attained all hardship by means of smell. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, to me, Smell is the best according to my personal experience. The two bodhisattvas called Bhaisajaraja and Bhaisajasmudgata, who were present with five hundred Brahmadevas, then rose from their seats, prostrated themselves with their heads at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, Since the time of our beginning, we have been skillful physicians in the world and have tasted with our own mouths herbs, plants, and all kinds of mineral and stone found in the world, or Sahar, numbering 108,000 in all. As a result, we know perfectly their tastes, whether bitter or sour, salt, insipid, sweet, acrid, etc., their natural changing or harmonizing properties, and whether they are cooling, heating, poisonous, or wholesome. We received instruction from the Tathagata and knew clearly that taste was neither existing nor non-existent, was neither body nor mind, and did not exist apart from them. Since we could discern the cause of taste, we achieved our awakening, which was sealed by the Buddha, who then named us Paishajya Raja and Paishajya Samudgata. We are now ranked among the sons of the Dharma King in this assembly, and because of our awakening by means of taste, we have attained the Bodhisattva stage.
As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, to us, taste is the best according to our personal experience. Bhadrapala, who was with sixteen companions who were all great bodhisattvas, rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, When the Buddha, with an awe-inspiring voice, Bhishma Gajita Gosha Savara Raja, appeared in the world, I heard of the Dharma and left home. At the time of bathing, I followed the rules and entered the bathroom. Suddenly, I wakened to the coarser water, which cleansed neither dirt nor body. Thereby, I felt at ease and realized the state of nothingness. As I had not forgotten my former practice, when I left home to follow the Buddha in my present life, I achieved state beyond study. That Buddha named me Bhadra Pala because of my awakening to wonderful touch and my realization of the rank of a son of Buddha. As the Buddha asks now about the best means of perfection, to me, touch is the best according to my personal experience. Mahakashapa, who was present with the Bhikshuni, Golden Light, and others of his group, then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, In the former Ian, when Chandra Zorya Pradipa Buddha appeared in this world, I had a chance of following him and of hearing the Dharma which I practiced. After he had passed away, I revered his relics, lit lamps to perpetuate his light and decorated his statue with pure gold powder. Since then, in every subsequent reincarnation, my body has been radiant with perfect golden light. This Bhikshuni golden light and the others who are with her are my retinue because we developed the same mind at the same time. I looked into the six changing sense data which can be reduced to complete extinction only through the state of nirvana. Thus, my body and mind were able to pass through hundreds and thousands of eons in a finger snap. By eradicating all dharma, things and ideas, I realized all hardship, and the world-honored one declared that I was the foremost disciplinarian. I awakened to the wonderful dharma, thereby putting an end to the stream of transmigration. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, to me, dharma are the best according to my personal experience. Meditation on the Five Sense Organs Aniruddha then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, After I left home, I was always very fond of sleep and the Tathagata scolded me, saying that I was like an animal. After this severe reprimand, I wept bitterly and blamed myself. Because of my sadness, I did not sleep for seven successive nights and went completely blind. Then the world-honored one taught me how to take delight in the enlightening Vajra Samadhi, which enabled me to perceive, not with my eyes, but my mind. The pure truth pervading the ten directions, very clearly perceptible, as easy to see as a mangle held in my own hand. The Tathagata sealed my attainment of our hardship. As he now asks about the best means of perfection, to me seeing is, according to my personal experience, the best which is made possible by turning the organ of sight back to its source. Kshudra Pantaka then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, I did not know much about the Dharma, for want of reading and reciting the scriptures. When I first met the Buddha, I heard of the Dharma and then left home. I tried to memorize a line of his Gatha, but failed for a hundred days, because as soon as I could retain its first words, I forgot the last ones. When I could remember the last words, I forgot the first ones. The Buddha took pity on my stupidity and taught me how to live in a quiet retreat and to regularize my breathing. At the time I looked exhaustively into each in and out breath and realized that its rise, 
stay, change, and end lasted only an instant, Kushana. Thereby, my mind became clear and unhindered until I stepped out of the stream of transmigration and finally attained all hardship. I came to stay with the Buddha, who sealed my realization of the state beyond study. As he now asks about the best means of perfection, to me, breathing is the best according to my personal experience in turning the breath back to the condition of nothingness. Gavampati then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, Because of my verbal sin when I trifled with monks in a former aeon, in every succeeding reincarnation I have been born with a mouth that always chews the cut like a cow. The Tathagata taught me the pure and clean doctrine of one mind, which enabled me to eliminate the conception of mind for my entry into the state of Samadhi. I looked into tasting, realized that it was neither a subjective substance nor an objective thing and leaped beyond the stream of transmigration. I thereby disengaged myself from both the inner body and mind and the outer universe and was released from the three worlds of existence. I was like a bird escaping from his cage, thus avoiding impurities and defilements. With my dharma, I now pure and clean. I attained all hardship, and the Tathagata personally sealed my realization of the stage beyond study. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, to me, the turning of taste back to its nowhere is the best according to my personal experience. Bilindvatsa then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, When I first followed the Buddha to enter upon the path, very often I heard the Tathagata speak about the worldly, which could not give joy and happiness. One day I went to town to beg for food, and as I was thinking about his teaching, I stepped inadvertently on a poisonous thorn that pierced my foot and caused me to feel pain all over my body. I thought of my body, which knew and felt this great pain. Although there was this feeling, I looked into my pure and clean mind which no pain could affect. I also thought, how can this one body of mine have two sorts of feeling? And after a short mental concentration on this, all of a sudden, my body and mind seemed to be non-existent, and three weeks later, I achieved a stage beyond the stream of transmigration and thereby attained our hardship. The Buddha personally sealed my realization of the stage beyond study, as he now asks about the best means of perfection. To me, the pure awareness that wipes out the conception of body is the best according to my personal experience. Subhuti then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, As my mind was already free from all hindrances in former eons, I can now remember my previous reincarnations as countless as the sands in the Ganges. Even when I was a fetus in my mother's womb, I had already awakened to the condition of still voidness, which subsequently expanded to fill all the ten directions, and which enabled me to teach living beings how to awaken to their absolute nature. Thanks to the Tathagata, I realized the absolute voidness of self-natured awareness, and with the perfection of my immaterial nature, I attained our hardship thereby entering suddenly into the Tathagata's precious brightness, which was as immense as space and the ocean, wherein I partially achieved Buddha knowledge. The Buddha sealed my attainment of the stage beyond study. I am, therefore, regarded as the foremost disciple because of my understanding of immaterial self-nature. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, According to my personal experience, the best consists in perceiving the unreality of all phenomena, with the elimination of 
even this unreality, in order to reduce all things to nothingness. Meditation on the Six Consciousnesses Shariputra then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, In former eons, the sight's perception of my mind was already pure and clean, and in my subsequent incarnations as countless as the sands in the Ganges, I could see without hindrance through all things either on a worldly or supramundane plane. One day, I met on the road the two brothers, Kashyapa, who were both preaching the doctrine of causality. And after listening to them, my mind awakened to the truth and thereby became extensive and boundless. I then left home to follow the Buddha and achieved perfect sight perception, thereby acquiring fearlessness, attaining arhatship and qualifying as the Buddha's elder son, born from the Buddha's mouth and by transformation of the Dharma. As the Buddha now asks about best means of perfection, according to my personal experience, the best consists in realizing the most illuminating knowledge by means of the mind's radiant sight perception. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha and declared, I was already a son of the Dharma king when formerly I was with the Thagatas, who were countless as the saints in the Ganges. All the Buddhas in the ten directions who teach their disciples to plant Bodhisattva roots urge them to practice Samantabhadra deeds, which are called after my name. World Honored One I always use my mind to listen in order to distinguish the variety of views held by living beings. If in a place separated from here by a number of words as countless as the saints in the Ganges, a living being practices Samantabhadra deeds, I mount at once a six-tusked elephant and reproduce myself in a hundred and a thousand apparitions to come to his aid. Even if he is unable to see me because of his great karmic obstruction, I secretly lay my hand on his head to protect and comfort him so that he can succeed. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, according to my personal experience, the best consists in hearing with the mind, which leads to non-discriminative discernment. Sundarananda then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, When I left home to follow the Buddha, although fully ordained, I failed to realize the state of Samadhi because my mind was always unsettled. I was, therefore, unable to reach the condition beyond the stream of transmigration. The world honored one then taught me and Costella to fix the mind on the tip of the nose. I started this meditation and some three weeks later, I saw that the breath that went in and out of my nostrils was like smoke. Inwardly, both body and mind were clear, and I looked through the external world, which became a pure emptiness like crystal everywhere. The smoke gradually disappeared and my breath became white. As my mind opened, I achieved the state beyond the stream of transmigration. Both my in and out breaths, now bright, illumined the ten directions so that I attained the Arhat stage. The world honored one prophesied that I would win enlightenment. As he now asks about the best means of perfection, According to my personal experience, the best is to eliminate breath, which will then turn the radiance, ensuring the attainment of the stage of perfection beyond the stream of transmigration. Purnamaitrayani Putra then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, In former eons, my power of speech was unhindered and I preached the doctrine of misery and unreality, thereby penetrating deep into the absolute reality. I also expounded in the assembly 
the Tathagat is Dharma doors to enlightenment as uncountable as the sands in the Ganges, and thereby one fearlessness. The world honored one knew that I had acquired the great power of speech and taught me how to perform the Buddha work by preaching. There, in his presence, I assisted him in turning the wheel of the law, and since I could give the lion's roar, I attained arhatship. He sealed my unexcelled skill in expounding the Dharma, as he now asks about the best means of perfection. According to my opinion, the best consists in employing the Dharma voice to subdue the enmity of Mara, and to stop the stream of transmigration. Upali then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, "I personally accompanied the Buddha, and we climbed the city wall to flee from home. With my own eyes, I saw how he endured hardship in his practice." During the first six years of ascetic life, subdued all demons, overcame heretics, and freed himself from worldly desires and all impure efflux, asarva, from the mind. He personally taught me discipline, including the three thousand regulations and eighty thousand lines of conduct, which purified all my innate and conventional subtle karmas. As my body and mind were in the nirvanic state, I attained arhatship, and the Tathagata sealed my mind because of my strict observance of discipline and control of body. I am now a pillar of discipline in this assembly, and am regarded as the foremost disciple. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, in my opinion, the best. Consists in disciplining the body so that it can free itself from all restraints, and then in disciplining the mind so that it can be all-pervading, which results in the freedom of both body and mind. Mahamodgalyana then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, "One day, as I was begging for food in the street, I met the three." Kashyapa brothers, Uluvilva, Gaya, and Nadi, who preached the profound doctrine of causality taught by the Tathagata, suddenly my mind opened and became all-pervading. Then the Tathagata gave me a monk's robe, and when I wore it, my hair and beard fell out. I rambled in the ten directions and met no obstruction. I thus acquired transcendental power, which proved the foremost and led to my attainment of arhatship. Not only the world honored one, but all the Tathagatas in the ten directions praised my supernatural powers, which were perfect, pure, sovereign, and fearless. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection. In my opinion, the best consists of returning to stillness, to allow the light of the mind to appear, just as muddy water, by settling, becomes pure and clean as crystal. Meditation on the Seven Elements. Uchushma then came forward in front of the Tathagata, joined the palms of his two hands, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared. I can still remember that in a very remote eon, I was filled with sensual desire. At the time, a Buddha called the King of Immateriality appeared in the world. According to him, those with lustful desires increased their own hell fires. He then taught me to meditate on the bones in my body, on my four limbs, and on my warm and cold breath. So, by turning inwardly, the spiritual light for pointed concentration, my lustful mind turned into the fire of wisdom. Since then, I was called Firehead by all the Buddhas. Because of my powerful firelight samadhi, I attained arhatship. 
that I took my great vow to become a demigod, Vira, so that when all Buddhas were about to attain enlightenment, I would personally help them to overcome the enmity of Mara. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, according to my opinion, the best consists. In looking into the non-existent heat in my body and mind, in order to remove all hindrances thereto, and to put an end to the stream of transmigration, so that the great precious light can appear, and lead to the realization of supreme Bodhi. Dharanendra Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared. I still remember that formerly, when the Buddha of Universal Light appeared in the world, I was a bhikshu who used to level all obstacles, build bridges, and carry sand and earth to improve the main roads, ferries, rice fields, and dangerous passes, which were in bad condition or impassable to horses and carts. Thus, I continued. To toil for a long time, in which an uncountable number of Buddhas appeared in the world. If someone made a purchase at the marketplace and required another to carry it home for him, I did it without charge. When Vishvapu Buddha appeared in the world and famine was frequent, I became a carrier charging only one coin, no matter whether the distance was long or short. If an ox cart could not move in a bog, I used my supernatural power to push its wheels free. One day, the king invited that Buddha to a feast. As the road was bad, I leveled it for him. The Tathagata Vishvapu placed his hand on my head and said, "You should level your mind ground. Then all things in the world will be on the same level." Upon hearing this, my mind opened, and I perceived. That the molecules of my body did not differ from those of which the world is made. These molecules were such that they did not touch one another and could not be touched even by sharp weapons. I then awakened to the patient endurance of the uncreate and thereby attained arahatship. Then, by turning my mind inwards, I realized the bodhisattva stage. And when I heard the Tathagatas expound the Buddha's universal knowledge in the profound Lotus Sutra, I was the first listener to be awakened to it, and was made a leader of the assembly. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, in my opinion, the best consists in looking into the sameness of body and universe, which are created by infection from falsehood arising from the Tathagata's door. Until this defilement vanishes and is replaced by perfect wisdom, which then leads to the realization of supreme Bodhi. Chandra Prabha Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, "I still remember that in the remotest of eons, countless as the sands in the Ganges, there was a Buddha called Varuna." Who appeared in the world and taught bodhisattvas to contemplate the element of water in order to enter into the stage of samadhi. This method consists in looking into the body wherein all watery elements do not, by nature, suppress one another, using as subjects of meditation first tears and snot, and then saliva, secretion, blood, urine, and excrement. And then reversing the order, thereby perceiving that this element of water in the body does not differ from that of the fragrant oceans that surround the pure lands of Buddhas, situated beyond our world. When I achieved this contemplation, I succeeded in realizing only the sameness of the element of water everywhere, but failed to relinquish my view of the body. I was then a bhikshu practicing dhyana, and when my disciple peeped into the room, he saw that it was filled entirely with clear water, without anything else. As he was an ignorant boy, he picked up a broken tile, threw it into the water with a splash, 
gazed curiously and left. When I came out of my dhyana state, I suddenly felt pain in my heart, as if I had the same trouble which Shariputra had with a wicked demon. I thought, since I have realized arahatship, I should be free from all causal ailments. Why today all of a sudden have I pain in my heart? Is it not a sign of my backsliding? When the boy returned and related what he had seen and done during my meditation, I said, "When next you see water in my room, open the door, enter the water, and take away the broken tile." The boy obeyed, for when I again entered the Diana state, he saw the same broken tile in the water. He then opened the door and removed the tile. When I came out of Diana. My pain had vanished. Later, I met countless Buddhas before I encountered Sagara Varadara Buddhi Vikridita Bhikkhya Buddha, under whose instruction I succeeded in relinquishing the conception of body, thereby realizing perfect union of this body and the fragrant oceans in the ten directions with absolute voidness. Without any further differentiation, this is why I was called a son of a Buddha, and was qualified to attend all Bodhisattva meetings. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, in my opinion, the best consists in achieving the unhindered, universalizing pervasion of the element water. Thereby realizing the patient endurance of the uncreate, which ensures complete enlightenment. The bodhisattva of crystal light then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, "I still remember that once, in the remotest of eons, countless ascetics in the Ganges, there was a Buddha called Infinite Voice." Who appeared in the world to reveal to bodhisattvas the profoundly enlightened fundamental awareness, which, by looking into this world and the bodily forms of all living beings, could perceive that all were created by the power of the wind arising from illusory concurrent causes. At that time, I inquired into the illusory setting up of the world, changing time, bodily motion and motionlessness, stirring of mind. In other words. All kinds of movement, which were fundamentally the same and did not differ from one another, I then realized that these movements had neither winds to come nor whither to go, and that all living beings, in the ten directions, as uncountable as the dust, came from the same falsehood. Likewise, all living beings in every small world of the great chiliacosm were like mosquitoes in a trap in which they hummed aimlessly. And created a mad tumult. Soon after meeting that Buddha, I realized the patient endurance of the uncreate. As my mind opened, I perceived the land of the imperturbable Buddha in the eastern region, where I was admitted as a son of the Dharma King, serving all the Buddhas in the ten directions. My body and mind gave out rays of light that illumined all the worlds without obstruction. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, in my opinion, the best consists in looking into the power of the element of wind, which has nothing real on which to rely, thereby awakening to the body mind so as to enter samadhi, and then to reunite with the profound one mind expounded by the Buddhas in the ten directions. Akashgarbha Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, "When the Tathagata and I were with Dipamkara Buddha and realized our boundless bodies, I held in my hands four big precious gems, which illumined all Buddha lands in the ten directions as uncountable as dust, and transmuted them into the absolute void." Then my own mind appeared like a great mirror 
emitting ten kinds of mysterious precious light, which penetrated the ten directions, reaching the boundaries of space and causing all pure lands of Buddhas to enter the mirror, and then to intermingle freely with my own body, which was just like unobstructed space. Then my body could enter perfectly as many samsara countries as there are grains of dust to carry out far and wide the Buddha works of salvation so that universality could prevail everywhere. This great transcendental power derived from my close inquiry into the four elements, which had nothing real to rely upon and into false thinking that rose and fell Alternately and ended in nothingness. I realized the non-duality of space and the sameness of the Buddha's pure lands and samsaric worlds, thereby achieving the patient endurance of the uncreate. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, according to my own experience, the best consists in the close examination into boundless space, leading to entry into samadhi and perfecting thereby the mysterious spiritual power. Maitreya Bodhisattva then rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, I still remember that, in the remotest of eons, as uncountable as the dust, there was a Buddha called Chandrasoya Pradipa, who appeared in the world to comfort others. I followed him to leave home. However, I still cherished worldly fame and liked to mix with noble clans. Then the Tathagata taught me how to practice dhyana meditation on the mind's consciousness in order to realize the state of samadhi. Ever since the following eons, I have used the samadhi to serve Buddhas as many as the saints in the Ganges thereby eliminating completely my previous mindset on worldly fame. When the Pamkara Buddha appeared in the world, under his instruction, I realized the consciousness perfecting supreme samadhi of the mind, which enabled me to perceive that all Tathagata stores and samsaric worlds, purity and impurity, and existence and non-existence were but appearances, caused by my own mind's transformations. World Honoured One, because of my clear understanding that only the mind's consciousness was the cause of all externals, I perceived an unlimited number of Tathagatas coming out of the nature of consciousness, hence the Buddha's prophecy that I shall be his successor. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, my opinion is that the best consists of close examination into all appearances, which are created by consciousness only, in order to perfect the conscious mind, thereby realizing complete reality and ensuring non-reliance on externals and the breaking of all attachments caused by discrimination, thereby achieving the patient endurance of the uncreate. Mahastama, a son of the Dharma king, who was the head of a group of fifty-two bodhisattvas, rose from his seat, prostrated himself with his head at the feet of the Buddha, and declared, I still remember that, in the remotest of eons, countless as the sands in the Ganges, there was a Buddha called Amitabha, who was succeeded by eleven other Tathagatas in that Kalpa. The last one was called, The Buddha Whose Light Surpassed, That of the Sun and Moon, he taught me how to realize the state of samadhi by thinking exclusively of Amitabha Buddha. By way of illustration, if a man concentrates his mind on someone else while the latter always forgets him, both may meet and see, but without recognizing each other. However, if both are keen on thinking of each other, their keenness will grow from one incarnation to another until they become inseparable like a body and its shadow. The Tathagatas in the Ten Directions have compassion for all living beings and always think of them, like a mother who never ceases thinking of her son. If the son runs away, her thoughts of him will not help. 
But if he also thinks of her with the same keenness, they will not be separated in spite of the passing of transmigrations. If a living being remembers and thinks of the Buddha, he is bound to behold him in his present or future incarnation. He will not be far from the Buddha, and thus, without the aid of any other expedient, his mind will be opened. He is like a man whose body, perfumed by incense, gives out fragrance. Hence his name, one glorified by Buddha's fragrance and light. From my fundamental cause ground, and with all my thoughts concentrated on the Buddha, I achieved the patient endurance of the uncreate. This is why I help all living beings of this world to control their thoughts by repeating the Buddha's name so that they can reach the pure land. As the Buddha now asks about the best means of perfection, I hold that nothing can surpass the perfect control of the six senses with continuous pure thoughts in order to realize samadhi.